This is a Media Lab podcast. Oh, Henrik, dear, don't you have anything less gloomy to practice? It isn't gloomy. It's profound. Welcome to Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show, and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. Okay, as you may have noticed as you downloaded this episode, we have a super long show for you today, but that is mostly because we're talking about three songs, and it felt wrong to split them up. I do want to let you know about three things. First is that I was a guest on another podcast where I got to continue talking about Stephen Sondheim. It's called Before the Downbeat. It's co-hosted by Mackenzie Horner and Autumn Smith. Mackenzie was actually a guest on this show a while back. They invited me onto their show to discuss Into the Woods, and we got into it. We talked for almost two hours about that show. I'll leave a link in the show notes for you to check it out. Uh, I thought it turned out really well, and I like to blabber for much too long about that show. Secondly, of course, I need to thank the lovely patrons of this show. This week, you'll be hearing some bonus audio from this episode, talking more about Sondheim and drag performances. If you'd like to support the show monetarily, which will only help to grow and make this show better, you can do so over at our Patreon page. Do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. I also need to give a huge thanks to the God That's Good tier from Patreon, the Holy Triumvirate of Jack, Todd, and Barry. You can go and find out more information by going to patreon.com slash putting it together podcast. Lastly, it's time for the return of Plodding Along. Plotting Along is the part of the show where I fill you in on what's happening in the plot of the show. So after the overture, we're introduced to some of the characters of A Little Night Music. The first is Madame Armfelt, the old matriarch of the show. She's sitting in her wheelchair and she begins trying to give life lessons to her granddaughter. She mentions how the summer night smiles three times, first on the young, second on the fools, and third on the old. We then segue into a triplet of songs, one who is sung by Frederick, who has married a girl much younger than him, Anne, who actually gets to sing part of the third song, and who still has not consummated the marriage with her new husband in over a year. Henrik sings the second song, and it's Frederick's son, who is this moody, only a year older than his new stepmother, and is kind of a sexually frustrated seminary student. They sing together to introduce many of the themes this show will deal with. Let me go thank some sponsors, and then when we return, it'll be me talking about Now, Later, and Soon with Daniel Bund. Putting It Together is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. The first sponsor this week is from ATB. Even now, good advice is within reach. Your financial situation today, tomorrow, or this very hour is why ATB is here. ATB will listen and help with the knowledge and solutions you need right now. Why? Because ATB was built to help Albertans. For more information, visit atb.com. This week, we are also brought to you by the Alberta Podcast Network. Let's go and listen to one of our other great shows. It's a conspiracy! All right. It's a Conspiracy is the podcast where we lay out the beliefs behind selected conspiracy theories, alternative accounts, legends, myths, and more. We do our best to present these without coloring them with our opinion until the end, where we let our feelings fly. We also do beer reviews, chat about geek culture, and whatever else strikes our fancy. Good times. And we're a part of the Alberta Podcast Network. Locally grown, community supported. As the sweet imbecility tumbles so lavishly onto her lap. Oh, Frederick, what a day it's been. An ending drama. Now, question. there are two possibilities. A, I could ravish her. B, I could nap. That grumpy old Miss Nordstrom from next door. Her sister's coming for a visit. Say, it's the 
ravishment, then we see the option that follows. Daniel Bunn, thank you so much for joining me here today. Hello, hello. Because you are a brand new guest on our show, maybe we can start off by you letting the people listening uh, who you are and what it is that uh, you're up to nowadays. Sure. Yeah. So I, um, I'm an actor and singer and performer and uh, a drag performer as well, particularly. So uh, right now I'm living in Portland, Oregon, which is my hometown. Um, and pre-COVID, I was doing multiple shows a week, mostly performing for straight women at brunch. Uh, <laughs> so lots of champagne spilled on outfits. Um, and, you know, of course, because of uh, the viral plague, um, I haven't been doing much of that at all. So I've just been, uh, you know, watching YouTube and uh, listening to podcasts. And the other sort of the big quarantine project for me is that um, I've been writing a, like one act musical for my drag character. Yeah. Um, and that is written um, and I'm going to be filming it over the next few weeks and then wow. hopefully putting it on YouTube. Yes. Now, I could spend, uh, I'm going to say a good 20 minutes talking about brunch specifically, but I will bypass it's that for worst. a moment. It's the worst. And uh, I want to know more about your drag performer. Uh, like, what, who is this persona? Yeah. So her name is Ann L. Fisher. And uh, my tagline and the name of the show is that um, I'm the punk rock paralegal. So <laughs> she's 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 very like business career woman, uh, mature, 30 something, pretty much myself. But she also like wants to be a rock star. She, she can sometimes look messy, sometimes look put together is sort of that. But um, I don't I don't necessarily do like the typical sort of drag that you would see on um, a certain television show. It's definitely not that like polished. That's like by design. Um, my approach to drag has always been about like the performance itself rather than the aesthetics. It's basically an extension of me being like somebody who loves performing and who loves theater and who loves storytelling. So a lot of the numbers I do are like storytelling numbers. Like I'll use props. Sometimes there is literally a plot. And I'm also known for doing really stupid stuff, um, including Irish step dancing Oh. That's something I'm particularly known for. And uh, roller skating. Hopefully not at the same time. It's hard to do that on your toes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, during your performances, then, are you writing then original music for that or are you using existing stuff? I've just now started writing original stuff for it. Um, my my actual my BFA, I have a BFA in dramatic mm -hmm. writing, which is playwriting and screenwriting. And I specifically did playwriting. But realistically, uh, lip syncing to other people's stuff is significantly easier um, sure. for me. Now, some people will say it's harder, but and, and I can certainly like see that because when you're lip syncing to somebody else's music, you have to know it in a way that's very different than sort of performing it live because you are very much beholden to exactly when they say certain things at exactly a certain time. And if you're really right. going for it, sometimes you're trying to get like the breaths in and like very like small nuances with what they're doing. You know, I, I have a lot to say about like what drag is or what drag could be. And uh, there's a lot of sort of drag that's contemporary that I would say is sort of built on the, the tradition of the music video, um, particularly sort of the music videos that in the 80s, like Madonna and Janet and people like that who were lip syncing to themselves. And I think that's where a lot of the drag performative culture comes from now certainly in this country you know yeah even like in film someone can correct me if i'm wrong it is my understanding that i think still to this day there's only been two movie musicals that have actually sung essentially live to tape which was sweeney todd and les mis right. um, and people can have their opinions on whether that was successful or not but yeah most of the time it is lip synced uh and you've done a performance maybe even months beforehand and now you're trying to match that on the day of filming, uh, which can impact, you know, the output. It's definitely very limiting. Um, if you are, you know, I, th I think when you're on stage interacting with the audience, you have that sort of immediacy. It's easier to be 
immediately in the moment. Whereas if you're if you're just recreating something you've already made, you're very much stuck in that. And that's why I think mm-hmm. sometimes movie musicals don't feel authentic in the right. same way that they do on film. Uh, I think before we started recording, you mentioned how you're in Portland. What is the drag scene like in Portland? It's sort of two pronged. Mm-hmm. Um, there is the sort of mainstream pop oriented sort of pop mm-hmm. culture or drag. Um, and then there's another scene that's definitely very like weird and artsy. I'm not necessarily like the ambassador for all Portland drag. Um, but I think just like anywhere else, it's really varied and diverse. And there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of gender diversity. There's a lot mm-hmm. of like, there's a lot of drag kings. There's a lot of faux queens, which is somebody who is, say, identifies as a woman, uh, dressing up as a woman, and mm-hmm. faux kings. And some people are just not doing any gender at all, which is great too. I don't think that Portland is like well known for drag, but I think the drag scene here can be really interesting. Um, now, because of COVID, uh, there's very few venues that are open. Yeah. You know, I haven't been able to perform anywhere since March. Like the last gig I had was the Sunday right before we went into lockdown and everyone's like, what's going to happen? And it was this really strange thing. Um, and we were like using hand sanitizer before touching all of our ones and and yeah. feeling like really apprehensive. Um, and then, you know, since then, I haven't been performing. A lot of other queens have sort of pivoted to like digital shows and for me, that wasn't like as compelling. So now I, I'm working on something like film. So I have a bit more control over it, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of queens doing shows like on Twitch and Facebook Live and stuff. And and, and some some queens are still making money. Um, certainly the really famous ones are still able to make money. Uh, but for those of us who like actually worked in bars, it's definitely a bit of mm-hmm. a struggle. Um, fortunately, that's one of like three jobs I have. So, uh, you know. <laughs> right. like, as, <laughs> yeah, as with everyone, like two or three jobs here. Like, I, I feel like a broken record here in many ways. I think I've said this now dozens of times on this show since this global pandemic has started. But it's just like I miss so much going to live settings. What it's really proven to me, at least, is this whole like idea of like, you know, everything's going to transfer onto online. And this is even before pandemic, but like everything's going to transfer online and like what a great future. And like, it just isn't the same. I like being in that live setting. It's something different to be a part of a group that is seeing something that no one else gets to see. It feels like that there's that specialness to it. I'm missing it a lot. Like, I really want to be able to go back and experience that live setting again. Hopefully soon. Hopefully within the next year, we can go back. But yeah, we'll one see. would hope. I mean, you know, they just announced they have a viable vaccine, but that's it's, right. It's going to be a while before we all get it, especially us us kids who are, uh, you know, under 70. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, when was your first introduction to a little night music? I don't know quite what order I listened to all of the shows in. I think probably the first thing I got was like a compilation album Mm -hmm. and there would have been a few songs on it. I imagine it probably had liaisons and uh, Send the Clowns and maybe The Miller's Son. I think I heard those songs independently and then I started getting the individual cast albums. So this this would have been one of the it probably was like the fourth or fifth show I actually got into. I, I'm sure Into the Woods was first and then probably Company. And then I say Follies and Sweeney Todd were about the same time. And, and then I maybe kind of went in order, actually. Oh, yeah. From there. Yeah. Was that original cast album then of A Little Night Music? Y- yes, definitely. I don't think there had been a revival at that point or not on Broadway. Um, I don't think. Yeah, no, I think. Well, we're talking it about was, the 90s. It was 1999, so we're dating right. ourselves, but well, we're not literally. We're not dating. Not yet. I, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I, the, the, yeah, that's basically what I was experiencing Sondheim for the first time was in the 90s, too. But uh, 95 would have had a London revival, but uh, I was going to say any of the revivals in New York were from the opera. So there was no right. Broadway revival until 2009. Right, right. And, and I think partly because this song, this song deals with some difficult subject matter. It's very adult. Sure. Um, I don't think that, you know, it's not something that high school kids are going to be able to do really. And I think because of that, it's probably been like less seen than it should be. It's also really hard to sing. Yes, and there's that too. It's really hard to sing. So like you, you can't just get anybody off the street to sing these songs. 
Um, even the songs that are written for people who aren't supposed to be good singers are still quite difficult songs to perform. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think that the teenagers would totally understand a Swedish sex farce set in like the 1950s. But Oh, I think they would get it. I just think that like, I don't know that school administrators and parents yeah, would be that, like... That's true. You know, all up, all up about like, it. Yeah, but you super know, super into that idea. Hocus Pocus is all about a virgin, and here we are in this musical that is all about another virgin. So, where is the Hocus Pocus musical? That's what I'm asking. I'm sure somebody's Someone working, is on, working it. on it. Probably yeah. Mark Scheiman. Like he needs another bone thrown to him. Yes. Yeah. Probably, well, I yeah. think he was the. I could be wrong about this. I think he was the musical director for the movie. We don't fact check on this show, so I have no idea. Oh, good. Because I'm going <laughs> to say a bunch of stuff that I'm sure is it's not completely true. wrong. So th- the song we're si- well, songs I guess that we're talking about here today is essentially how the show starts, uh, unless we're talking about the film version of A Little Night Music, which I'm gonna show my hand maybe that? too early uh I'm, the less said about the movie the better probably but i okay. will eventually discuss the movie in full uh, yeah yeah okay but it, it starts a different way let's just say that mm-hmm. for right now but this is traditionally now later and soon are this like triplet of songs uh that starts off the show now depending on where you listen to this like in the book finishing the hat that sondheim wrote he separates those into three separate songs and I would say on most cast albums, it also gets separated into three separate songs. But on the original cast album, it is not. It is one song called Now, Later, Soon. Uh, so I am considering this a f- like one piece, which because they all come together at the very end, I think is meant to be one complete piece. That's what we're going to be talking about here today. We are looking at three different versions of A Little Night Music here this season. So we're looking at the original Broadway cast from 1973. The London Revival cast from 1995, and then the Broadway Revival from 2009. So I like to give credit where credit is due. And so here are some of the people that you're going to be hearing in this episode. So the character of Frederick, the three people that were in those performances were Len Cariou, Lawrence Guitard, and Alexander Hansen. Henrik is portrayed by Mark Lambert, Brendan O'Hay, and Ryan Herdlicka. And then Anne is played by Victoria Mallory, Joanna Riding, and Ramona Mallory. Now, here's a little fun thing that I only discovered here this week. Can I bring that up? You might notice that there's a, the, uh, a name that is shared between those actresses who played Anne. So the Ramona Mallory from the 2009 revival is the daughter of Victoria Mallory from the uh, original Broadway cast, and her father is the original Henrik from the original Broadway cast, Mark Lambert. So it's kind of interesting that uh, she got to play the same role that her mother did years and years before. Yeah, that's one of those that's one of those extremely cute like Broadway legend stories yeah. that, that you would hear from the, the old timey theater folk. <laughs> Let's jump into it here then. So the the song now starts this way. Frederick starts off by singing now as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly onto her lap. Now there are two possibilities. A, I could ravish her. B, I could nap. Say, it's the ravishment, then we see the option that follows, of course. A, the deployment of charm, or B, the adoption of physical force. Now, as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly onto her lap. Oh, Frederick, what a day. It's been unending dramas. Peter is brushing my hair. The now, is- there are two possibilities. A, I could ravish her. B, I could nap. That grumpy old Mrs. Bassett from next door. Her sister's coming round for a visit, and you want to... Say, it's the ravishment, then we see the option that follows, of course. I do hope I'm imperious. deployment of charm or be the adoption of physical force so daniel we should probably just talk about the elephant in the room right at the get-go um actually i have a funny story first sure, well it's, sure, not, say, it's not that funny len Carew did an interview and originally apparently they called him in to play count malcolm oh interesting yeah so he had originally they had originally brought him in to audition for that and he had no interest in the role whatsoever um but he happened to like see the script i think they sent it to him and he opened it up and like the first lines that were sung were this opening line you know now as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly and he's like i want to play that role and i think he ended up talking to hal prince and and sort of agreeing that 
they also realized that they didn't want him for Count Malcolm either, which is mm-hmm. good for all of us, really. Um, yeah. And so he ended up getting the part. But yeah, it's it's that sort of that opening line is actually really, truly beautiful if you like stop to unwrap it. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I would say even these first two, like we'll talk about subject matter here in a moment. But like the actual way that the words fit together is, I mean, we, we call Sondheim a master or I do a lot of times here on this show, but this is, I can think, proof to it of like how everything fits so neatly together into like this puzzle piece of songwriting that he is so interested in that feels or sounds so nicely to the ear. Yeah, I think I think this is probably one of his most like sophisticated, clever lyrics. I mean, I think there's sophistication in simplicity, certainly. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is not simple whatsoever. But it, what it is doing is telling us his character and the way that he thinks in a really beautiful way. And so as a character introduction, it's a very it's a very strong one. It also has a downside here, which I suppose we should just yeah rip the bandit yeah. off, so to speak. And that is, you know, essentially the, one of the first things he says to us is, hey, should I rape my wife? Right. And right. Um, yeah. so essentially our introduction to him is, you know, this sort of choice of either I should just take a nap, which is a purely innocuous thing. And sort of, um, you know, the actual word used is ravish, which potentially doesn't mean it's, it doesn't explicitly mean like rape. But I think that is mm-hmm. the cultural understanding of that word. And so that's a really heavy thing to start off with, um, particularly viewed through a modern lens. Yeah, I think you could definitely hand wave it away a little bit if it was just the ravishment piece. But he then explicitly brings up physical force in the very next stanza. So I think that removes any ambiguity to this. Yes. And I I guess it, it definitely like it definitely makes me feel icky. For mm-hmm. sure. It, it definitely brings up really complicated feelings. And one thing I have noticed when watching it, I've actually found like four or five filmed productions now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've noticed that the older the production, the sooner the audience laughs. Um, like in the older productions, like there's a there's a video of the New York City Opera production in 1990. And the audience laughs when he says ravish or nap. Um, whereas in more recent productions, it takes them a while to think this is remotely funny at all. So you can right. see the audience kind of reacting to it in that way. And then the other thing I will say that is really interesting is um, having now recently watched the original film that this is based off of, is that this mm, yeah. this internal monologue here that he's having is not whatsoever in the film. And in fact, in the film, uh, the Frederick character very distinctly says to Desiree, like, I would never try and force her. I want her to come to me. So somewhere along the line, somebody made this choice. Yeah, I think that's important to point out, like, even though this is adaptation, they do change the actual motivations of the characters and even plot points. They change from the original source material. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Um, Actually, another fun story here um, that I read, and that is um, originally when they were getting together to adapt this, Steve had a totally different idea for the show. Yeah, he did. He was in like um, sort of this George Firth, like uh, post Follies, post company stage where he was like really into like experimental stuff. And so his like original idea was that the whole show would just take place over like the night of the dinner and it would be, you know, Madame Armfelt playing solitaire. And like the show would kind of be like a series of different possible outcomes as she played solitaire. And then the writer, Hugh, uh, wait, yeah, Hugh Wheeler, Hugh Wheeler yeah. yes, I always get him confused. So um, he, the writer Hugh Wheeler was having a really hard time sort of working with that idea. Like he he kept like trying to just tell the story as it's told in the movie. Yeah, like he uh, Hugh, Hugh Wheeler, I think, yeah, it basically where him and Sonnen had the biggest disagreement is like, I just write things from start to finish. Like he didn't like to do experimentation very much as like. Something happens and that leads through to the to the rest of the plot. And so I was like, no, like let's have like dream sequences and callbacks and all this other stuff uh, that uh, he didn't really want to do. I think in this case it worked for the best. I don't know if this show would have worked with like a looser format, mm-hmm. but we won't know, of course. So although that would be kind of fun, actually, you know, if you believe in the multiverse, that exists, that uh, that that that, that version exist exists somewhere. somewhere. So the the monkey's paw that I don't want to make that wish on is 
that uh, you would be sacrificing so many great songs, I think, from the show had they went with that original idea instead of what we kind of ended up with. And actually, Sondheim now admits that even though he fought hard to do it his way and ultimately the rest of the creative team decided not to do it, he was like, uh, this out of any of his shows, he thinks actually holds up the best out of most of his shows, which is interesting that he would say that, that he thinks that this is the one that has the best book uh, to to it. So let's uh, take that for what you will. I, I From sort of like my background in like, I you know, I went to school for playwriting and um, I spent four years sort of studying dramatic structure like i would agree with that in the sense of the way that the plot structure it is 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 pretty textbook um mm-hmm. but a lot of that is really just comes down to the film like it, it pretty seriously yeah. mostly follows the beats of the films yeah although weirdly enough my possibly um unpopular opinion and i actually think about this from the actually the original film as well uh smiles of a summer night is i think the last bit of the movie always feels rushed to me where like it leads up, it leads up and then everything kind of happens at once. Yeah. So anyways, that's we, that'll be me a uh, discussion for, for a later day. No, that's, that's actually, that's pretty much how I felt. I felt otherwise the movie was beautiful, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you're like, wait, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, we're done. We're over now. <laughs> Which incidentally is basically what happens in the film musical too. Yeah. Where what takes like 20 minutes on stage takes like five minutes and you're just yeah, like, they just what? rush through that. They, <laughs> they just, everything happens all at once. Um, the last thing I just wanted to call out about this section, honestly, is this is, again, I think sometimes love of like numbers, puzzles, that sort of thing. It's I think he's having a little bit of fun with uh, Frederick basically going like A, B, like these two choices, because like the first A, B that he says is A, I could ravish her, B, I could nap. And he says, well, what follows, of course, is A, the deployment of charm, B, the adoption of physical force. But like the A from the original statement would actually feel more akin to the B of the second thing that he lists. So he's kind of flipping those two things around. It goes from like pretty hardcore to innocuous. And then the second time is it's like innocuous to like physical force. So he's like the, he's playing around with that a bit. Yeah, I, I feel like that clearly was deliberate. Yeah. And I mean, in general, the song is definitely setting us up to think that he's a successful lawyer. I mean, he's certainly thinking faster than probably most any of us would. And so that that can't be like accidental, but maybe it's that. I, I don't know. I'm not actually sure what we think he might be saying there. It, it could be a number of things, but it, it could be that. Mm-hmm. He's actually not that great of a lawyer, but he just kind of gets away with stuff <laughs> because he has a good personality, which is often maybe. the case. I, and we don't we don't know that, of course, but it, it could be there's definitely a reading of this song that Frederick is sort of conceited and arrogant and, and sort of thinks of himself as sort of better than he is. You could sort of say that that would fit into with that. And I guess I see that. But I also like every actor who's ever played Frederick has been infinitely charming. And right. I don't know that we're supposed to dislike the main character. And yet there's elements of this song that are making us want to dislike him right off the bat right yeah well i guess i think this is the hard part about this entire storyline for a modern audience is that even though like in the script we're talking about well it's a 40 year old man uh having married an 18 year old girl uh which is already a little bit icky and stuff like that but at this (laughs) i guess there's a very like strong but he has not forced himself on her he's respecting her wishes not to have sex like so, like, he is not a lecherous man, but at the same time, he is a man that is willing to marry someone that's almost half your age or is half his age. Yeah. And I think that maybe for Frederick and Anne, status is a very important thing to them. Yeah. Um, certainly, Anne says a lot of things to that extent. And so I, there probably is some element of, of Frederick wanting to be viewed as still attractive. Um, and so him marrying a, a younger woman certainly makes him look better in that regard that he was able to sort of like capture somebody like that. And so, you know, that may definitely be a critical component there, even though by all accounts, it's it's a bad idea for these two to get married. But here they are. Right. Well, here they are. Um, so Frederick continues on going. Now, B might arouse her, but let us assume I trip on my trouser leg crossing the room, her hair getting tangled, her stays getting snapped, my nerves would be jangled, my energy sapped. 
Removing her clothing would take me all day, and her subsequent loathing would turn me away, which eliminates B, and which leaves us with A. Now B might arouse her, but let us assume my trip on my trouser leg crossing the room. Her hair getting tangled, her stays getting snapped, my nerves will be jangled, my energy sapped. Removing her clothing would take me all day, and her subsequent loathing would turn me away, which eliminates B and which leaves us with A. Could you ever be? So I just, again, this has got a little bit of wordplay that's going on here, but anything that you wanted to call out about like those two stanzas? Yeah, that's basically an anxiety nightmare to me. Um, <laughs> you know, sort of the thing that keeps you up at night, where you're like, oh, what am I going to say when... You know, somebody calls on me or whatever. It, it's basically that, but, you know, as an internal monologue, and he's basically thinking worst case scenario. And again, his primary concern here is looking foolish. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I don't know why I never thought about this before. I, I'm glad you called this out. This does feel very much like me in the shower rehearsing a conversation I want to have later in the day with somebody that I might find attractive. It's like, okay, I'm going to say this, and then they're going to do this, and then what if I do this? And uh, and then you almost like talk yourself out of it sort of thing. But like he's all he's instantly going to like worst case scenario as he, you know, wants to uh, as he tries to cross the room, he's going to like tumble and fall and look like an idiot. Going forward, this is going to be a little bit of a longer section here. Frederick says, now, insofar as approaching it, what would be festive but have its effect? Now, there are two ways of broaching it. A, the suggestive and B, the direct. Say that I settle on B to wit a charmingly lecherous mood. A, I could put on my nightshirt or sit disarmingly B in the nude. That might be effective, my body's all right, but not in perspective and not in the light. I'm bound to be chilly and feel a buffoon, but nightshirts are silly in mid-afternoon. Now, insofar as approaching it, what would be festive but have its effect? Shall I learn Italian? I think it'd be amusing if the verbs aren't too irregular. Now, there are two ways of broaching it, A, the suggestive, and B, the direct. But then French is a much cheaper language. Everyone says so. Say say. that I settle on B to wit a charmingly lecherous mood. I know you like my hair this way, but on top of my head, like a siren. A, (laughs) I could put on my nightshirt or sit disarmingly B in the nude. Oh, Frederick, you should have seen that the great arrival. That my body's all right, but not in perspective and not in the light. Poor Henrik, how comical I'm bound to be chilly and feel a buffoon, but nightshirts are silly in mid-afternoon. Why are virtuous people so silly? Never have I more aligned with a lyric than... <laughs> My body's all right, but not in perspective and not in the light. Yeah, it's that's that's kind of how I feel whenever I have a hookup. Right. Um, you know, you know what I mean? Being single and you're like, you're like, I don't know. Um, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I, I definitely feel that. I, I think we do identify with him in that regard, specifically oh, because, sure. you know, the audience is going to be primarily older because that's who can afford to go to the theater. So. Well, there's well, there's, there's be a lot of men I, I, in the audience who are like, yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> the, the performances I've seen of this song, too, that is usually where most of the audience will laugh because it is such like, yes, we we understand what you're talking about. And he's also usually taking his clothes off. Um, yeah. So sometimes it's, it, it can be like, depending on how the, pretty much every actor who I've seen play it actually is like hot dad, dad vibes. Um, they usually don't just like. <laughs> cast whatever it's not like a frumpy dude here it's, it's usually yes. like you know um a guy that you wouldn't you know you wouldn't kick out of bed uh depending on your standards right right a daddy we know yeah yeah, yeah. you know hot dad um hot dad vibes so it's one of those things like yeah he's he's he, he is worried about like how he looks here but like he, we can see it he looks all right but mm-hmm. not in perspective not compared to her right yeah and she is also yeah usually played by someone who's very beautiful right like we, we, we understand <laughs> where these two people stand, whether it's class or not. The, the thing that I also love about this part, uh, again, this is this wordplay and him going back and forth between A and B and these two choices that he has. I do not think it is a mistake that it's the letter B in the nude, right? It's like, A, I could put on my nightshirt or B, I could be in the nude. Because that sounds like he's saying... I would be in the nude. Like it just runs together here. So if you're not paying attention, you still know what he's saying, but he is actually listing things uh, in that lyric as well. Yeah. I imagine he probably had a chuckle, you know? Oh yeah. He's sitting there with his little legal pads and be like, ha, you know, (laughs) knowing how Sondheim writes. Yes. He's on his, on his back on his legal pad with Mm -hmm. his little pencil. Uh, And yes, there's a few times when I read a lyric, it's like, he probably did chuckle when he wrote that down. 
Yeah. I mean, I've had that experience for sure. I've been sitting there hunched over the laptop uh, <laughs> in front of a, usually a YouTube video of a train and uh, just, you know, just drinking wine and being like, I don't know. And then like, ha, I thought, yeah, I've totally had that exact <laughs> That's experience. Right. I am the most brilliant person who has ever lived. I don't think I've ever had that thought. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. We now get to, I honestly, my favorite part of the song. Um, although is it because you're an English major? <laughs> yes, it is 100% because I'm an English major. And um, Sondheim disagrees with me. So we'll talk about that yeah, okay. too. But uh, so this is what Frederick says, which leads to suggestive but how to proceed. Although she gets restive, perhaps I could read. In view of her penchant for something romantic, the sod is too trenchant and Dickens too frantic, and Stendhal would ruin the plan of attack, as there isn't much blue in the red and the black. The Maupassant's candor would cause her dismay. The Brontes are grander, but not very gay. Her taste is much blander, I'm sorry to say, but is Hans Christian Andersen ever risque? Which eliminates A. Which leaves the suggestion, but how to proceed? Although she gets rested, perhaps I could read. In view of her fancy for something romantic, Desaad is too chancy and Dickens too frantic. Stendhal will ruin the plan of attack as there isn't much blue in the red and the black. The Maupassant's candor would cause her dismay. The Brontes are grander but not very gay. Her taste is much blander, I'm sorry to say, but is Hans Christian Andersen ever risque? Which eliminates her. So I want you to tell me first, how do you, how do you take this section? I mean, again, he's overthinking everything. Um, and it, it's also comical to me that he'd be like, oh, maybe maybe she'll be turned on if I read, you know, um, right, yeah. which it's not like that's not something we would probably do now. Right. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I don't know what normal people do now. Um, no, only nerds read. Right. Essentially. Uh, no, I feel like people read more now, especially right now. Yeah. But yeah, this sort of list of like authors and uh references to them and they're not like they're not necessary i mean i'm not i'm not as much into like classic literature as you are so for me like these are more they're not obscure but you know what i mean they're 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 like not they're not like the most i would say like for a modern 2020 audience i'm just gonna say it for a modern 2020 audience dickens people probably know brontes people probably know i do not believe most other people would know the three other authors that are mentioned here unless you're kind of into the western canon a lot i mean i know of them but like i yeah. haven't read you know so for me it's one of those things like okay i know these people what i what i will say though is you know from an audience perspective this is coming so quickly that there's no like time to process this so this yes. is definitely one of those lyrics that like grows with you as you keep listening to for it sure. um because there's just there's just no way that you could possibly pick up on that as an audience, except for the joke at the end about Hans Christian Andersen, right? Yeah, never being risque. The the one that I'll call out that I think is actually a pretty funny line, but again, it goes by so quick. I think it only becomes funny if you read it or are with the music for for a while. So he mentions this author named Stendhal. Oh, I feel like I'm now mispronouncing his name, but Stendhal uh, did write this novel. Uh, he was French, but it was translated into The Red and the Black. That's what the, the book is called. And this is straight from Wikipedia as far as the description is. It's a historical psychological novel in two volumes published in 1830. And it chronicles the attempts of a provincial young man to rise socially beyond his modest upbringing through a combination of talent, hard work, deception, and hypocrisy. He ultimately allows his passions to betray him. Uh, and some critics have pointed to the title being a comment on the tension between the clerical the black and the secular, the red. So I th uh, I've never read this book. I will be the first to admit, but as far as I understand it, there's not a lot of like romance or, or risque stuff that happens in that. So that's why I love the idea that there isn't much blue in the red and the black. Like it's a funny line. Uh, well, at least it's a humorous line, but uh, I think it's going to go over most people's heads. Yeah. And I think also, cause now most people don't, think of like the term blue as meaning like off color or, right, or crass. Right. Like it's kind of a, like the first time I really heard that was like from a Phyllis Diller interview. Um, so <laughs> right, it's definitely right, like right. not a phrase that I grew up with, but I I think mm -hmm. in like other cultures, it's probably more common than the one I, I grew up in. That. 
So, but yes, I, I do notice, I, I noticed that as well, but yeah, it's one of those things where I'm like, again, I, I don't think I would have ever noticed that if I was sitting in the audience being like, what is he talking about? You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> it, yeah. But honestly, by that time it's, it's, you're already to Hans Christian Anderson. And it's like, okay, we're going on with the rest of the song. Sondheim says this about this very lyric. This is another example of the difference between funny and clever. The two elaborately rhymed stanzas about the books Frederick considers reading to Anne have never gotten even a snicker, nor should they. They are a form of literary masturbation and too clever by half, a phrase British critics are fond of overusing. I like his little dig at the British critics. Talking about Britain a little bit, there's also something that Sondheim calls out about this section, which is the word penchant. Which is how Americans say it, but yeah. not how British people say it. And penchant. this is our, yeah, penchant, penchant or penchant. Yeah. Um, uh, anyways, it, the it has caused some issues. He has said because either you change the lyric to something different, or you just have them Americanize that section. And he's also said the opposite can happen too. Where like the way that British people pronounce a word when they come over to the U.S., the same issues can kind of happen, even though we technically speak the same language. My favorite one, by the way, is how British people say, uh, well, how I say garage, but it's garage over uh, in, in, in Britain. I, I got really confused by the names for vegetables when I lived there. Yes. Um, like because they tend to use French names like courgette instead of zucchini. And it took me like a good eight months to figure out what the hell they were talking about. Right. Um, Aubergine. For yeah, 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 yeah. I, I assume it's because we had more Italian immigrants in the U.S. So that's why we have Italian words. But it, that was that was the thing that I think probably got me the most. But I actually still find myself thinking things in British terms sometimes like um, like I still call like trash cans with wheels wheelie bins because it just mm. that sounds right to me. You know, uh, this is how <laughs> Sondheim, though, tried to fix this line. And this is, I think, hilarious in view of her fancy for something romantic. The sod is too chancy. Which, sure, kind of works. But the issue is, is that chancy doesn't rhyme with fancy in in Britain. Uh, it, 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 they're, they also pronounce it differently. But that is how they do it in the 1995 version. They actually use fancy and chancy. So they just have British people mispronounce it in a different lyric. So it's a, it's a very weird recording history with this song in particular. I will say this while we're on the subject of rewrites is that I don't know how, but it would be nice if somehow we could tone down the, the top of the song and sort of, I don't know. What do you think about that? I'm sorry. I don't want to just like jump no, no, right in with that, but that, that comes to mind when we talk about rewrites of, you know, he's certainly rewritten things before that were mm -hmm. no longer considered culturally acceptable. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know of anything with regards to this particular song. No, I haven't. I have never seen talk about that. But I mean, I could see you cutting out the first two stanzas and you'd be basically perfectly OK. <laughs> you could really jump down like, yeah, go into that section about him, like tripping over his trousers, like him being nervous about like crossing the room and trying to uh, be kind to her or trying to make her want to go to bed with him. And I could see that possibly becoming more and more of a thing at uh, the farther we get into, you know, the 21st century. I don't know. I, yeah, how would you do it? I think you could it? probably add in a few lines of dialogue and do that. It's unfortunate to cut out like a lot of a song, but I think the reality is that this guy is supposed to be likable, or at least that's my yeah. understanding, right? I, yeah, I think we're supposed to be on Frederick's side, yeah, honestly, for, sure. for most and of the show. Are, and, and this puts him not on our side, right? We have to be honest about like the fact that we can't always critique like things set in the past or things created in the past with like a modern lens. But like, you know, I'm not OK with spousal rape and I don't think most of the audience is. And I think it's a problem because, again, that thing that I said, we're like, you can see as people watch it more recently, like they don't laugh at all. Like they don't think it's funny. And it, I think it like kind of like sucks the wind out of the room a little bit. Yeah, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see as we go on here. I don't know when the next revival of this work is is being considered uh, but i think they're gonna have to contend with that as the the i just don't think it's as it's just not as acceptable as it was even in 2009 yeah i mean i think the only thing it would i mean there's some jokes in there that i enjoy but i don't it wouldn't it wouldn't negatively impact the story if we were to not know that stuff yeah. you know this is how the now portion of this song ends which is 
Now, with my mental facilities partially muddled and ready to snap. Nope, I said that wrong. Now, with my mental facilities partly muddied and ready to snap. Now, though there are possibilities still to be studied, I might as well nap. Bow, though I must to adjust my original plan. How shall I sleep half as deep as I usually can? When, now, I still want and or love you. Now, as always, now, Anne. Now, with my mental facilities partially muddied and ready to snap. Now, I'm sure about the brace and earrings, earrings, which earrings. Now, though there are possibilities still to be studied, I might as well nap. Oh, mother's rubies. Oh, oh the diamonds. Agony. Now, though I must to adjust my original plan. Ray arm felt. I know she'll wear the most glamorous gown. Ah. Shall I sleep half as deep as I usually can? Distinguished old Frederick. When now I still want and all love you. Now as always. Now I want to write an entire thesis on the fact that he says, now I still want and or love you. I think that is such a bizarre way to phrase that sentiment. And, and also because he's, he's also talking about Desiree, um, yes. which, which we don't know yet. But it, the, the, the fact that the lyrics work perfectly for her, in fact, actually make more sounds for her. Yeah. And it actually comes around like by the end of this cycle, like he, he will say Desiree, right? Yeah, he does. That's, Spoiler that's, alert. For yeah. <laughs> Shocking development. Who knew? Yeah. yeah. Um, show's over. So <laughs> that's two hours you just got back. But um, that's right. So, <laughs> I do think that's really interesting. And, and, you know, I think the reason why I love performing Sondheim songs more so than other musical theater is because he always gives us these like thought processes and choices mm -hmm. to make in the songs. Whereas in a lot of musical theater songs, the thought has already happened. And then the song is just like expounding on it right. um, or like exploring an emotional state. Whereas often with Sondheim, like the, the song is, is doing the thinking for us. Right. Um, yeah. And the decision making. And I think that's exciting as an actor. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing that I have to just say, what I actually kind of love about this section of this song and has been sprinkled throughout the, the beginning portion, too. As a person who is closer to 40 than not being 40, is that he's singing about, hey, do I do this thing that I want to do, or do I go and have a nap? And I have that conversation with myself a lot, <laughs> where it's like, you know, I could really just have a, like, a little snooze for the next 30 minutes. Particularly if there's something you don't really want to do, like going back right. to work from home. Exactly, um, exactly. <laughs> So we then kind of segue into the later portion of now, later, soon. And um, I'm, I'm going to say this right up front. For me personally, this is my favorite section. I just like the melody a whole lot. And maybe it's just because mm. I like cellos so much. But it's like I like the stringed uh, music that's underneath this. But Henrik is, yes, playing his, his cello. And Anne uh, is interspersed usually throughout this, telling him to be, be quiet, like your father's sleeping. It's it's weird because on the recordings, they always play a bit of dialogue, which actually happens before the song now. Right. And, yeah, yeah. and it seems like they always include that same bit of dialogue just to explain their relationship. For exactly. the people so listening, like, I why guess. is this happening? Yeah. Um, but it, it happens. It's already happened. And in fact, you know, Hendrix just had this fumbling encounter with um, Petra the maid, which I think is really informing this. But. Another interesting weird tidbit about this whole show is that originally Sondheim wanted every character to have an instrument that they yeah. would carry around with them. And so Henrik was the only one who ended up with the actual instrument. But it, it's funny that that is something that actually happened with later shows. Not this one. No. Um, just the ones, you know. <laughs> Bas well, John Doyle would make basically a career out of this doing Sondheim shows with people playing instruments throughout the entire uh, course of it. So. Yeah, it's interesting that he hasn't tried to do this one, to be honest. Unless he has, and I'm just not aware of it. He might have. He might have. So, this is what Henrik sings. He says, Later, 
when is later? All you ever hear is later Henrik, Henrik later. Yes, we know Henrik. Oh, Henrik. Everyone agrees, Henrik. Please, Henrik. You have a thought you're fairly bursting with a personal discovery or problem, and it's what's your rush, Henrik? Shush, Henrik. Goodness, how you gush, Henrik. Hush, Henrik. You murmur, I only. It's just that, for God's sake. Later. When is later? All you ever hear is later, Henrik. Henrik, later. Yes, we know, Henrik. Oh, Henrik, everyone agrees. Henrik, please, Henrik. You have a thought you're fairly bursting with a personal discovery or problem, and it's what's your rush, Henrik? Shush, Henrik. Goodness, how you gush, Henrik. Hush, Henrik. Murmur, I only, it's just that, for God's sake. Now, of course, I can't sustain my voice like he does, for God's sake. But um, this is essentially a song about sexual repression. So, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, you, it's, it's appropriate, I guess, that you would kind of like explode with, with God. <laughs> in, in this song but is there anything i guess that you want to mention about kind of that opening section well i i th- i think this is more of just like an overall thing to know about the show and particularly this character is that you know sondheim says when he talked about the show in the video of him teaching this song mm-hmm. he says something to the effect of you know this show has two tragedies one that they talk about and one that they don't um, so the tragedy that's talked about is the fact that Frederick and Anne have married, even though nobody thinks it's a good idea. But the other tragedy is the fact that uh, Frederick's wife has died. Um, right, and, yeah. And this, a couple of years before or something, yeah. Um, I actually, I think, I think it's quite a long way ago because if you um, just, the, the Desiree says that like, or they, they had their affair after his wife died. Oh, that's right. So you have yeah, to, yeah, yeah, you have to sort of right. put two and two together. So if she's been dead for for a good fifteen or so years. Yeah, so and then essentially, the he's only never reason had a mother. Anne, yeah, so because like the only reason that even Anne marries him, she even says this explicitly. It's like you look so sad, and so I wanted to make you happy. And she thought that the way to do that was to marry him, which is like such a juvenile thing to think. Yes. Like, oh, yeah. this is you know. It's going to solve your problems. And of course, of course it doesn't, which is why it's a tragedy. But you know, meanwhile, poor Henrik, who everybody calls poor Henrik, because literally he, he lost his mother when he was probably like three or four. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I imagine he was probably raised by like a governess, you know, mm-hmm. and even though uh, Frederick seems to be a good dad from the interaction we've had with him. You know, that's that's he, he certainly didn't raise him. So, you know, it's it makes sense that he's like moody and angsty, you know? Well, like he is like literally the personification of teenage angst. Like he basically just needs to have like a comb over on his eye or something like that. Because the way this the song sometimes even starts, right, is uh and telling him like, hey, like uh, stop playing that gloomy music. And he's like, it's not gloomy. It's profound. It's like this is like every teenager that you meet. <laughs> Like me, you know, like when yep. I, when I was, I remember cause when I first got into the show, this was the song of the three that like I most wanted to sing, even though I cannot hit that note, yeah. uh, uh, which almost nobody can, which is why nobody sings it. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and even the people who do sing it don't usually hit it, but yeah, cause I mostly identify with that, like sort of his essential struggle here of, mm-hmm. of like, you know, feeling like it's never his time. Also, his great like sexual frustration here. I mean, he's about to enter the Lutheran priesthood, which at the time was a celibate sort of ministry. Right. So he had to you know, give up sex. So this is kind of his like last gasp of fumbling about that. You know, which is I think why he you know tries to go after the maid. But I I do think there's also this element of like lost because he's lost his mother. He's never really had a mother. I think you know that it's a little bit Oedipian. or Oedipian. Wait, yeah. Yeah, is that how it? Yeah, sure. Oedipal, Oedipal. That's yeah. the word. Mm-hmm, that's the one. Yeah, it's a little bit that, um, but you know, with a with a smaller age gap. Well, I think too. What what I love about this, there, I think, is very clear reasons why 
these songs are named now, later, soon, but it's also what kind of all these characters are dealing with. There's there's time in all of their storylines that they're basically contending with, which is, you know, Frederick is dealing with the, the, the here and now. What his biggest issue is, is that his wife is um, hasn't made love to him for the year that they've been married for uh, for, uh, for Henrik. We have the the people telling him all the time, do this later. Uh, putting it off to to the to the future, and it's like no, like I want to be in the now, but no one's allowing me to be in the now. And then we have Anne deluding herself. They're like, no, soon, soon, I'm going to be ready to to be a wife and everything too. When it's like soon is never actually going to come for her. So I think it's it's a playing around with that time, and it's very specific why it's you know called the way it is. Yeah, I, a time is absolutely a huge theme in this, and, and not even like in a subtle way whatsoever, you know? Right. Um, I mean, yeah, it's taking over like a very specific time frame. Like, like everything yeah. that the quintet sings has to do with time, right? You know? Yes. And, you know, this is another manifestation of that. And then, of course, there's there's a lot of talk of time, specifically about, you know, Madame Armfelt. She talks a lot about time. Um, and, and then another, of course, big theme is sort of like triangles, essentially, because you have... I mean, we're getting a little bit English lit here, but essentially, if you look at the characters, there's just overlapping triangles. Um, there is. And I think actually what the kind of a brilliant thing here is that this show is setting up that this triplet right here is a love triangle and they don't realize it's a love triangle yet. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's the first one we see, you know. Right. So, like, if anything, this should be the main plot if we were just thinking about classic construction, right? Exactly. But it isn't. Um, but that's partly because of the power of the character that they ended up creating in Desiree. Whereas, you know, realistically, this should be Frederick's show, but it, it just isn't. Yeah, he gets sidelined basically by the first uh, 30, 40 minutes. <laughs> you know what's interesting? I don't know if I, I don't know why this has popped into my head. Um, and just I just go with it. Well, I said, I don't know if I even agree with it, but I was going to say, like, even though as kind of plot heavy as the show is, I think it is so powerful based on the characters themselves. Like, I just like the character so much that it's just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like the plot to me is kind of secondary and it's funny, like how they all like interweave with each other. And yes, the love triangles and stuff that are going on are there, but it's just like, I just find all these people eminently interesting, fascinating. And uh, I want to be around them. Even, even in the original film where they're just a bunch of depressed yeah. Swedes. Like I just, I want to be with them for a bit. Yeah. Like I, I think that going to Ikea with Charlotte and Count Malcolm would be very yeah, entertaining. Be, there'd be something there. As yeah. long as I don't have to make any decisions or um, talk to them, but just to follow them around with my blue bag and, and be like, what is wrong with these people? Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so the next section is, is going to be just very short here, but Henrik says, Later, Henrik. Henrik, who is Henrik? Oh, that lawyer's son, the one who mumbles. Short and boring. Yes, he's hardly worth ignoring. And who cares if he's all damned? I beg your pardon. Up inside. Henrik. Is Henrik. Oh, that lawyer's son, the one who mumbles. Short and boring, yes, he's hardly worth ignoring And who cares if he's all damned? I beg your pardon, up inside Talking, like, just, again, going back to that fact of Sondheim writing songs that people can act really well Like, these are, he's essentially giving people stage directions on how to say this dialogue But you also have to sing it at the same time Like, it's done very, very well um, yeah, I think it, it, it goes back to that uh, story about West Side Story where mm -hmm. Robbins was like, well, what is this character doing? And I think ever since then, he's been like the exact opposite of that, where he's pretty much making it so that there's very, you know, you, there's really only one logical way to perform the song. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's taking some of that work away from the actor, but then it's allowing an actor. There is freedom and restriction in the sense that like having to uh, focus on a few decisions sometimes uh, means mm -hmm. those decisions are more powerful or impactful. That's a good point. Though the reason why I wanted to break this just into a shorter section is a, uh, a word change that only happens in the 2009 Broadway revival. And I don't know why they did it. They say, oh, that lawyer's son, the one who mumbles short and boring. In the 2009 version, he says bland and boring. Oh, that lawyer's son, the one who mumbles bland and boring. Yes, he's hardly worth ignoring. So I don't know that 
like possibly my thing is that Ryan Herdlicka from that version is tall. And so it doesn't make sense for him to say short and boring. Yeah, I think I've seen a few versions where they say boring. And it's it's because I think the actor actually does have to be short. Or otherwise, they say bland. I just think short is funnier. It's a funnier line <laughs> of him. Than, oh, you know that lawyer's son, the short and bl- um, bland one? I think uh, it would be sorry, even funnier if one. he was really tall, you know? Yeah. Because people that's true, just that is true. like if he was like six foot seven, that would be funny because it's like, wait, what? It's it's because like he's so easily ignored that people think he's shorter than he is. Like that would be funny, right? Right. Um, but so, yeah, I, I think short is a better lyric, even if the actor isn't even short, because I no. don't really think except for people like us who know um, and probably have heard the words before. Like we're not you're probably not going to think that critically about that. But like, but no, it's not going to stand out. <laughs> Here's how it ends, though. He sings, as I've often stated, it's intolerable being tolerated. Reassure, Henrik, poor Henrik, Henrik, you'll endure being pure, Henrik. Though I've been born, I've never been. How can I wait around for later? I'll be 90 on my deathbed and the late or rather later Henrik Eggerman doesn't anything begin. As I've often stated... It's intolerable being tolerated. Reassure, Henrik, poor Henrik, Henrik, you'll endure being pure, Henrik. Though I've been born, I've never been. How can I wait around for later? I'll be 90 on my deathbed and the late, or rather later, Henrik Egerman. Doesn't anything... Begin. I'm telling you, this is stuff I could, you could do this as a soliloquy without any music being there, and it works, <laughs> which is really great. I think this, there's, I just want to do a, a slight callback here because I think Sondheim does two things. In this one, he is using like that er to like do a bunch of rhymes and internal rhymes, uh, which is reassure, poor, endure, pure. And earlier on, it was the ush sounds, right? What's your rush, shush, gush, hush? Uh, so he's having a little bit of fun of him doing these kind of like kind of inner complicated rhymes inside of these lyrics. But um, anything that you wanted to point out here in the end of the of this middle section? Yeah, the I think the other reason he's choosing those specific words is because they sound like the cello. Um, mm. And the length of the words and the vowel sound is also emulating the cello. So you have these like short, plucky lines. Like mm-hmm. when he says, as he says, like, as I've often stated, like that's that's him plucking. And then you have words like when you say the word endure, it does kind of sound like the bow kind of you know right. slipping off the strings a little bit. Um, so he has these like plucky lines and then he has these like words that would be played with a bow essentially. Um, so he's really trying to emulate the instrument itself. So I, I'm really curious to know what instruments he would have picked for all of the other characters. For the other people? Yeah. Well, uh, only because that he's so focused on like the waltz as kind of being the basis of this show. Like there's a lot of triplets and, and, oh gosh, I've forgotten the, the term for it, but like the time he's in threes here for most of the songs. Uh, I'm wondering if you would have stuck with strings for every person and just have a different stringed instrument to represent the person. But I don't know. It'd be an interesting exercise. Yes. Although, of course, if he wanted to give everybody their own instrument, he'd have to start getting really deep there. Uh, you know, Charlie, we playing the Urdu or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> there's just not enough string instruments. Um, so maybe we playing the banjo, maybe. Oh, Arm I, I, I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sitting away, plucking like she's on the porch. One um, person has, like, Charlotte has the spoons. It's yeah, be great. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it is. I, I do fall back too much into, like, ed- edgy, like, teenage uh, Kyle. But doesn't anything begin? I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting statement and question to end the, this song with. Because I think it basically sums up everything he's been singing about up until that point. Like, he wants so- something to begin and it doesn't feel like anything has for him. It, him it yet. sounds like something Angela Chase would say in my so-called life. Right. You yeah, know, no, that's for, a good call. For those yeah. of you who remember. Um, if not, look it up. There's one season. Yeah. 
There's, um, you, you can find <laughs> stuff on the internet. <laughs> it is weird that he never really gets another song after this. Um, yeah. I, thank you for bringing this up because I was going <laughs> to do this too, which is uh, out of all the characters. Well, I guess Anne doesn't really get a, her own song either. But for all these characters in the show, like they spend an awful lot of time in subsequent songs having like these randos come out and talk about like the passage of time. And even when uh, Desiree and uh, Frederick see each other again, well, while she's performing on stage, it's like uh, these two people come out and sing a song about like their love affair that happened previously. There really isn't songs for some of these other characters ever again in, yeah. in, in the entire show. And I, maybe that there's just not an opportunity, but they definitely, it, it definitely at the end when you hear like the snippets of song coming back in sort of like as a, as like a ghost in the background that are, mm-hmm. it's not always in the cast albums, but um, usually during sort of the final 15 minutes, they'll bring back the snippets of these earlier songs and have like two of the quintet singing them in the background. Um, but we never really hear these two sing again. Um, other unless they're part of like a group number a group yeah like weekend in the country i think is the only other time they sing I uh, could be wrong and Anne that, sings think... in you must are in, in uh in every day a little death which is my favorite song. oh yes um, yeah, 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 but she's right. she's kind of barely in that and in fact they cut her out in the movie it's <laughs> yes. it's weird because these are the two hardest roles to sing so you need the two best singers and yet they never sing again um mm-hmm. so I don't know why that is, you know. Well, they they just kept telling them, you know, later and soon you'll be able to sing. But then it never, never came. And I think, you know, if this were a Rodgers and Hammerstein show, uh, which it wouldn't be for other reasons. But if it were, like they would have a (laughs) song when they run away together, you know. Or maybe I'm not doing them enough credit because I actually think maybe they're a little bit better than that. If you were a bad Rodgers and Hammerstein imitator, then you would put a song there at the end, I guess. Well, talking about Anne specifically, she gets a little bit of a time to sing by herself before they all come back in together. And so she starts off this song soon by singing, soon, I promise, soon, I won't shy away, dear old soon, I want to, soon, whatever you say. Even now, when you're close and we touch, and you're kissing my brow, I don't mind it too much. And you'll have to admit I'm endearing. I help keep things humming. I'm not domineering. What's one small shortcoming? And think of how I adore you. Think of how much you love me. If I were perfect for you, wouldn't you tire of me soon? All too soon, dear old... thoughts on the lyrics here but anything that you wanted to mention about this um i i love the line if i were perfect for you wouldn't you tire of me thank you for saying that because i want you to explain it to me because i don't know if i 100 percent understand what she means i think that she's sort of saying that relationships are, are more interesting when people aren't like 
perfectly compatible. Um, and mm. to take that to like the furthest extreme would be like Virginia, who's afraid of Virginia Wolf? Right. I mean, that's essentially that couple's deal is that they're, they're not perfect for each other, but it's the fighting that keeps things interesting. And that's like part of why they're still together is because they're entertained right. by each other. And I think that's what she's saying is like, Hey, like I'm really imperfect for you in a number of ways, but I'm perfect because I'm imperfect because we're not a good match because I'm keeping your life interesting. Um, I think that's, that's cool. what she's yeah, saying. I like, that. I like that a lot. Yeah. That makes a whole lot more sense. I don't think, I don't think that she's nearly as dumb as like, <laughs> I don't think they're really making her out to be dumb at all, but, but there is this sort of, you know, element of that but really just cause she's young. Um, mm-hmm. and, She's not dumb, but you know, and she, she, she is like, I think she does, she does have a good sense of what's going on, even if she's making really bad decisions, you know? Yeah. I think, I think this is, and this is going to, you know, I'm old man now saying this, but it's like, I don't think she's a dumb character, but she's a young character. And I think sometimes people conflate those two things, young and dumb, which I, which I don't agree with, but even like Frederick starts off this entire triplet of songs being like, you know, as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly onto her lap, right? Because she's just, like, uh, talking about her day and, like, all these things, and he's, like, barely listening to what she's saying. Now, he calls that imbecilities. He isn't calling her an imbecile, but the stuff coming out of her mouth sounds stupid. So I don't think, yeah, she's supposed to be dumb. Uh, She's just young and, like, uh, uh, may not be as, you know, world knowledgeable yet, but uh, she's getting there. And I think by the end of the show, you're you're supposed to understand, like, yeah, she's she's smarter than what people give her credit for i i have a question for you kyle and and you know there's maybe not one good answer here but like do you think like she really knew what she was getting into when she got married no because i like but she's supposed to be 18 now so she was 17 years old when she married this 40 year old guy in the movie Uh, she marries him when she's 16 which is definitely creepy (laughs) yeah super creeps uh because i he honestly in the original movie the guy looks 50 to me but anyways that's which is weird because he's like supposed to be younger yeah and so is desiree she's only supposed to be like 35 quite strange yeah this is (laughs) well this also supports my theory of like the hard living that happened in like the 50s to like the late 70s where people come on screen and like their real age in real life is like they're 40, but they look like they're 55 in today's standards. Like they just look so much older. Anyways, I don't think she knows. I think that she was impetuous. I think that as we kind of mentioned before, her thinking that she was going to make him happy just by the fact of marrying her and then realizing, Oh, like a wife is supposed to do uh, certain things with her husband. And I am not ready for that. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to be ready with that, uh, ready for that with this person either. And I think she's trying to delude herself. Like that's the things what this song is really about is like, soon I'm going to be ready to do this. And soon I'm going to be, you know, gung ho and be this perfect wife and everything's going to be great. But no, like this is, this is never going to work out. I mean, it's, it's even entirely possible that she didn't have any kind of education as to what sex was. That is also true. Uh, the the other, I think, the counterpoint to that, which I think is actually even more fascinating, is that the the original movie as well as this musical makes us believe, or leads us to believe, that Frederick actually does a hundred percent love her. Like he is in love mm-hmm. with her, uh, and is not just putting it on and like lecherously going after her. Like he does have affection for her so that's like an interesting dynamic i think to this story and there is genuine devastation later on when things yeah. don't work between them work out i mean that's literally the whole lead up to sending the clown mm-hmm. is him like hey i love my wife and i can't be with you even though it's a bad idea and everyone acknowledges it <laughs> everyone um, knows it yeah 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 exactly and i i think that she loves him too mm-hmm. and and not not in not in the way of like a true romantic partner. I think she, she loves certainly the status that she gets by being a married woman. And she definitely talks about like her dresses and her jewelry and stuff like that. But you know, it was her idea to get married. Like, I think she had, it sounds like he was a business partner of her father. So he's like someone that she saw a lot, like growing up. I don't know. Maybe he reminded her of her own father. Maybe he's just a replacement father, but I think there is like genuine love there, even if it's not like romantic love. No, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I think there's, there's something to that. And I think the different actors actually bring different elements to that. I, uh, how much they think the affection runs in each of those people. Now we get into this overlapping singing 
And it's literally almost impossible without listening back, like how this all works together. But let me try and break it down. So uh, Anne goes soon. And then Henrik breaks in later and says, I promise. And Henrik says, when is later? And then let me read you all the stuff that uh, Anne says. She says, soon, I won't shy away. Dear old soon, I want to soon. Whatever you say, even now, when you're close and we touch, and you're kissing my brow, I don't mind it too much. Henrik is singing, later, Henrik, later, all you ever hear is, yes, we know, Henrik, oh, Henrik, everyone agrees, Henrik, please, Henrik, later, when is later, all you ever hear is, later, Henrik, later, as I've often stated, when, maybe soon, soon, I'll be 90 and dead, I don't mind it too much. And then Frederick is singing in his sleep, mind you. He's asleep at this point. Now, as the sweet imbecilities trip on my trouser like Stendhal eliminates a, eh? But when, maybe later, when I'm kissing your brow and I'm stroking your head, you'll come into my bed. Soon, later. I promise. When is later? Soon, later. I won't shy away. Yes, we know. Henrik, everyone agrees. Henrik, please, Henrik. Soon, oh, as the I sweet want Henrik to later, all you ever hear is soon. My later, Henrik, later, 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 Uh, so there's another section left to sing, but those overlapping uh, dialogue or those overlapping singing scenes, anything that you want to mention about them? It's definitely true that when you're listening to it, it's really hard to focus on what any one of them are saying. I, yeah. I tend to notice the Frederick lines because they're absurd. Um, yeah, that, like, I, I, I have to say, I, lo- I love <laughs> it because it really underscores the fact that he's falling asleep, where he's just taking random bits of his previous song and mashing them together and they don't make a lick of sense. I also noticed that everybody says the other times, uh, the time word. So, like, yes. I think everybody says soon now and later. Yeah, even so though- Anne is now saying, Anne is now singing now. Henrik is now saying uh, later. Frederick is saying, Frederick is saying later. And Henrik is the one who's saying soon. So, yeah, they're flipping around what they were saying before. Uh, you know, and this this sort of like the way that he had to force these together. Um, actually, so, you know, going back to that sort of conversation about how his original uh, Stephen Sondheim's original concept for the show of having it be a bit more experimental in form. After that, he was like, oh, it's just going to be a regular musical comedy. I'm not really that interested in that. So mm-hmm. one of the things he did was to give him this challenge of writing everything in 3-4 time or, or a derivative of 3-4 time. Yeah. Um, these three songs are actually all in a different time signature, um, I think. Yeah, Anne's song is the only one that's actually in 3-4 time, which traditional mm-hmm. waltz time. Um, so the other songs have to be like kind of woven in there. And so this was like his way of giving himself a puzzle, basically. Yeah, like this is him giving himself like a, a homework assignment and <laughs> and working for it. And also just the, the the thing, another thing that he sort of said a lot is that he doesn't like just sort of chorus numbers where everybody's singing the same time, same thing at the same time, because mm-hmm. it's illogical that a bunch of people would be having the same thought. Right. Um, and so, you know, again, we have this number, which is which could be a chorus number. They could all be singing the same thing. But instead, he's chosen not to do that and given himself and then anyone performing this a much bigger challenge as a result. Well, this is how the whole thing finishes off. So I'll do the same thing as I did before. So this is everything that Anne sings. She says, and you'll have to admit I'm endearing. I help keep things humming. I'm not domineering. What's one small shortcoming? And think of how I adore you. Think of how much you love me. If I were perfect for you, wouldn't you tire of me later? We will later. We will soon, soon, soon. Henrik is singing, Since I have to admit I find peering through life's gray windows impatiently not very cheering, do I fear death? 
Let it come to me now. Now, now, now. Come to me soon. If I'm dead, I can wait. How can I live until later, later, later? And then Frederick is singing, and you'll have to admit I've been hearing all those tremulous cries patiently, not interfering with those tremulous thighs. Come to me soon, 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 soon. Come to me soon, straight to me. Never mind how, darling. Now I still want and or love you. Now as always, now, Desiree. One big thing that I just want to call out here, and again, something I really love that Sondheim does uh, in his lyric writing, is kind of go with uh, against your expectations. Because earlier in this kind of section, Anne says, like, if I were perfect for you, wouldn't you tire of me soon? And here, she actually sings that again, but um, if I were perfect for you, wouldn't you tire of me later? So she's, yeah, flipping around to the two different kind of time frames there through us. So I love that little little piece how about frederick talking about her thighs i mean that is song in there which i honestly and this is maybe i shouldn't admit this but i did not realize until this week that's what he actually was singing <laughs> in this song i think that i picked that up like a while ago i just forgotten about it yeah. um and i realize now when you read it that he was talking about Anne specifically but mm -hmm. he's probably seen more of desiree's thighs than he's ever seen of Anne's thighs sure so you know is he or, you know, is he is he already talking and thinking about Desiree at this point? You know, I'm inclined to say yes. I mean, mm -hmm. he's probably been thinking about her since he saw the posters of her being in a play in town, you know? Right. Exactly. Um, I, I think that he, uh, she's already on his mind. And I think that comes full force here at the end of the song. And it's really the the driving force of the rest of the show. Right. He says Desiree and now knows that he had, probably had the previous relationship with her. And is now freaking out the fact that he just wants to rekindle that relationship and not pursue her anymore, even though she doesn't want to pursue him. So it's all this complicated relationship stuff. I mean, I think that goes back to her being like, it's more fun when things are not easy, you know? Yeah, I think that's true. But yeah, you're right. If if he had never like had a verbal dream where he said Desiree's name, there wouldn't really be a plot. They would just go to the show and, and maybe that would be it. Or maybe he would go see Desiree, but he would never tell his wife about it. You know? Yeah. Um, so maybe he <laughs> should have tripped on his trousers like that would have saved everyone. Yeah. The time. yeah. What are your final thoughts, though, on this song? Like as far as like um, an introduction into this show, do you think it does a good job? <laughs> mediocre job bad job like where do you sit on on that i love it of course um you know i loved it the first time i heard it because because it's atypical i think that it sets up the expectation that this is going to be a comedy for adults you know mm -hmm. i think it does serve like the mechanical function in that sense while also like giving us insight into the characters and making them complicated from the start you know a lot of times mm -hmm. we don't get the complications in the character till later, if at all. Um, I think one of the best things about the show is that it gives us so many complicated characters. Um, I mean, you know, we were talking earlier and there's, there's, there's basically six women roles who are like nuanced and subtle. And that never happens in a musical, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I think it does a good job to that extent. It is interesting that Desiree isn't first. And that and that goes back well, to the discussion, like, who is the main character? Like, <laughs> well, what's what's kind of fun, too, is that because the name Desiree has just been stated, 
it does give this air of mystery like oh who is this person like who is desiree uh until we eventually get to meet her here a little bit later and it does actually it does make her seem more exciting than she probably really is you know sure like that's i that seems to be her thing is that you know everybody thinks her life is more glamorous than it is and that's why she's kind of tired of it. But on the surface, it looks really fun and exciting. Certainly your daughter thinks so. Yeah, uh, that glamorous life. I wish. Daniel, thank you so much for joining me here today. If people wanted to stay in contact with you, is there a way to do so online? There is. Now, big caveat, and that mm-hmm. is I don't care about social media much at all. Um, but I realize I have to do it. I don't have much social media presence for my drag character, but I am working on it. Um I have an Instagram account and that's a good place to follow. Um, It's my full drag name, which is Ann L. Fisher, which is spelled A-N-N-E-E-L-L-E-F-I-S-C-H-E-R. And then I'll probably be building, I'll I'll probably be creating a YouTube channel soon um, because as I mentioned, I have this show that I've been writing and I'm about to film it and I'm going to put that up there and it's a, it's a pretty DIY thing. I'm filming at home in front of a green screen and, you know, resources. I love it. Who though. has them? That's great. Um, yeah. Not me. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening. You did make it to the very end. So thank you so much for that. You can send emails to putting it together podcast at gmail.com. You can also follow Sondheim podcast on Twitter and Instagram, and you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash putting it together podcast. Thank you to the Alberta podcast network and to ATB this week. Putting it together is available on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, Spotify, and Pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, we'll be talking about the glamorous life. I'm just dying by inches to talk about it. As always, a big thanks to the great Chris Taniguchi who designed the podcast artwork and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now. I'll enjoy it too. Oh, well, who wouldn't when all the posters call her the one and only Desiree Armfelt? I wonder what it would feel like to be a one and only. The one and only Anne Ackerman. <laughs> <laughs>